Hi, everyone. John Rutke here. Glad to be with you. Hey, I have got a couple of thoughts about my beloved friend, Lonnie Frisbee. I traveled with Lonnie. I was, I would say, one of Lonnie's closest friends. Um, and my wife, I would say I was his best friend, guy friend, and my wife was his best girlfriend. And I've been hearing a lot of things about Lonnie. He's on the, uh, out there being talked about quite a bit. And so I'm hearing things and I, I saw an interview with Greg Laurie the other day with, uh, I don't know who he's, who was interviewing him, but it was, it was a good interview. And, and I have a lot of respect for Greg and Greg also got discipled by Lonnie early on and Lonnie discipled me and, uh, discipled a lot of different people, but, um, he missed a big hunk of Lonnie's life, you know, um, the way that Greg had, had shared that. So I want to kind of fill in some things. So I think that it would be to your benefit to know about this because there's a lot of chatter about Lonnie. And of course he died of AIDS. And so there's a lot of controversy around that and those kinds of things. So, um, so I want to just share a couple of thoughts leaving, leading off of if anybody had watched what Greg had said about Lonnie, um, and Greg said that after, you know, three, four years at Calvary, that he didn't have that much time with Lonnie after that. And he said, I kind of lost touch with him. And, you know, everybody was moving out from the great move of God that had happened in Costa Mesa. And, um, you know, so people were planting churches all over. Greg was planting one in Riverside, which actually Lonnie helped start and who uh, the living room that that move of God came out of for Greg's church was Fred and Ruth Waugh's house, which were Lonnie's and mine, spiritual parents. So, so there's a lot of history there, a lot of really cool things that happened in that time period. But, um, you know, I, I had the president of Biola and um, Wheaton College come and meet with me and Fred Waugh, who was a uh, house we did this at. And Fred's 100 years old now. But they, they met with us uh, probably three years ago, two two years ago maybe. And um, they said that the Jesus movement was the last great awakening. And, of course, we're, I'm coming to you now after the Asbury revival has started. We went down to College Station just this last weekend for five days and saw the move of God down there. And all of a sudden... Texas A&M is on the, on the map. Um, so something's happening. There's a groundswell of the Spirit of God beginning to move like we've never seen before. Very exciting, especially for an old school Jesus movement guy. Uh, and also, even today, which is the premiere of Lonnie's, not Lonnie's movie, but the Jesus Revolution movie, uh, that Greg actually is the one who's, I would say, put the money together and put all of the things together. So it's really more about his story. But I'm grateful that he would allow Lonnie to be in that story, because if he didn't, it's there's no story. <laughs> That's how much of an impact Lonnie had on people's lives, and on specifically that move. Um, so we have that happening today. And I just wanted to get some perspective on Lonnie's life. I, I met Lonnie in 1979. Uh, so, you know, I spent a lot of time with him. He and I traveled all over the world up until 19, you know, I would say 87. So there was a big transitional period there. So I know a lot of the history of Lonnie. I know a lot of the history because he, was a, a, he wasn't just a mentor. He was a good friend. And so um, I want to share a couple of those thoughts. One of them is this. Lonnie helped established the beachhead of Calvary Chapel. There was no denying it. And I'm sure, I haven't seen the movie yet, but I'm sure the movie does a good job in projecting that, that he had that kind of an impact on him. So uh, I'm very grateful that they've allowed his name to be in there, you know. And also for Chuck, you know, I want to honor Chuck because Chuck was really a father figure to many, many people. And uh, was God really used him as that role. But it probably four years, five years into the Calvary Chapel, it, it morphed into, people didn't know, but the whole Calvary Chapel denomination, you know, it was amazing how fast and how quick things things uh, grew because 
just because of the 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 Kairos time that we were in, you know, many, 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 many people came into the kingdom at that time. And so, um, but Lonnie, I mean, think about it. He's 19 years old and he's pastoring probably 500 young people. And they moved from a little building to a tent to, you know, into a big building. But by that time, Lonnie was gone. And what had happened was, and a lot of people don't even know this about the, the Jesus movement. There was a lot of cult leaders coming to try to absorb people that were like, for instance, the children of God was birthed in that time period. David Berg was this guy's name. Uh, the Way uh, movement was starting in that time. And it's, it's interesting because these leaders that started these moves, which ultimately became real cults, uh, came after Lonnie because Lonnie was like a Pied Piper and they wanted to utilize him in that kind of capacity. So, and thank God for Chuck at that time, because Chuck was shooing them away. So we, we were seeing this acceleration uh, with people getting saved and all of those kinds of things. And many, many young people, I personally was a Buddhist, and I got saved on a college campus, walked up a Buddhist, came back a believer in Jesus. You know what I mean? That was how it was working back in that time period. But, but anyways, getting back to the story of Lonnie and like the, the, the timeline of Lonnie. When Lonnie was probably in the heyday of the Calvary Chapel movement, you know, you've got now you've got thousands and thousands of people coming. Uh, you've got community houses all over. Um, and all, most of the leadership came out of those community houses. It's amazing how uh, the communal living part of it, the worship came out of that. A lot of people came out of out of that that were leaders even to this day. But um, Lonnie was struggling in his marriage. And there was another move of God. And people don't even know this move. They called it the shepherding movement. And that was a move of God that came, I would say, more based in the charismatic movement. But man, you had some heavy hitters that were in this thing. You had Bob Mumford. You had Derek Prince, you had Don Basham, you had a couple other guys. They called them the F Fort Lauderdale Five. And, you know, they, they name things movements because there's a reason why. Because they move people. <laughs> That's what movements do. They move people. They move people closer to God. They move people closer to community. They move people closer to, you know, uh, their people's understanding of God and all of those kinds of things. But these guys in the shepherding movement, now this is, the, this is the next phase of Lonnie's life. They talked, Bob Mumford specifically talked Lonnie, because Lonnie was a Pied Piper, they were recruiting some of the younger people. Uh, but they were more kind of rigid, mi militaristic uh, kind of people. And Lonnie ended up moving down to Fort Lauderdale to try to s save his marriage, to try to put things together. So, you know, uh, it's hard to see one of your main leaders migrate out of your camp. So it didn't bode well for Lonnie to leave the Calvary Chapel system. And and quite honestly, you get stuck in your little bubble. And you, that's your world, man, the Calvary Chapel world. Uh, and that propensity happens to just, I think, every move of God. But what happened was Lonnie goes down to Fort Lauderdale trying to heal his marriage and didn't work out. Got divorced. His wife left him. And, uh, you know, he struggled down there. And these guys, look, these guys could preach the paint off of walls. They were so heavily anointed. And, you you know, Derek Prince, he was a scholar. He was a, he was a Greek scholar. But they came up with this, they termed it the discipleship movement, another movement. And... What happened was they, and I, I, I love, I heard it from Catherine Coleman. She said this, any overemphasis of any one particular spiritual truth becomes spiritual error. And so they overloaded the discipleship part of this and it became a controlling kind of a deal. Lonnie told me, he said, by the time these guys, although he became very close to Derek and his wife, he said, by the time they were done with me, he says, I didn't even know whether I was saved or not. So he comes 
completely shipwrecked back from that ordeal down in Fort Lauderdale, comes back to Chuck, and Chuck brings him back in, back on staff, because that's all Lonnie's known, is just ministry. And Lonnie said, they put a vest on me and made me have to help park cars during the church services. He says, that's how I started out. He says, I was just grateful to be back with the, with the people of God. And he says, but here I am parking people that I led to the Lord, you know, eight years ago. And I led their whole family to Christ. And here I'm pointing them to where to park their car. It was super humiliating and really broken. You know, Lonnie was really broken. So, uh, so he's going through this whole thing, going back with Chuck. And, um, all of a sudden, Chuck is letting Lonnie back in, letting him start to preach a little bit. He has a Wednesday night group. And of course, anytime Lonnie started anything, it became viral and always with signs and wonders. You know, they, they were not putting stuff in the back room. It was happening out in the front. I think that, that uh, you know, Chuck, because Chuck came from a four square background, and he saw the abuses of, you know, spiritual over spiritualization of things and gifts of the Holy Spirit not being done properly. You know, I think that he had probably, you know, bias towards those things and didn't want it to get out of control because he's more of a teacher, line upon line, precept upon precept teacher, which was great, you know, which got people in the word. But, you know, if you don't have spirit and truth together, you have nothing. You know, spirit without truth, you blow up. Truth without the spirit, you dry up, put the two together and you'll grow up. That was kind of our claim to fame on that deal. But anyway, so Lonnie told Chuck, I feel like God is calling me to be a missionary and that I'm getting under the burden of the Great Commission. And I think God's going to use me. And he's hoping that Chuck would send him out f helping him financially. <laughs> and he told me, the Lord, he said, I went to go pick up my paycheck this this one day, and in this little box is a note and says, Lonnie is now living by faith. <laughs> he gets no more paychecks. <laughs> Lonnie said, you know, I started to live by faith on his master card. <laughs> he said, that's how I lived by faith, until I maxed out every every credit card. Lonnie was not a money guy. He was not a organizational guy. He was none of those kinds of things. You know, he was he was really a hippie, but he was a gifted artist too. You know, that's another thing people didn't realize. He he got saved up in the Haight Ashbury. And um, I mean really God gripped him there because he was on an art scholarship up there. So he was in that whole scene in that in that time period. So anyways, he Chuck puts that note out and Lonnie says I just felt compelled to order tickets for around the world with him in a buddy pass, uh, a good friend of mine, Peter Crawford, and Lonnie's friend. And he and Pete traveled all around the world. I got a global pass, but he had no money. So he made these arrangements for it with, <laughs> with the uh, travel agents, because that's how you had to do it back in that time period. And what happened was he didn't have any money. He was asked to speak on his, what he was about ready to do on a radio show in Costa Mesa. So he goes onto the radio show. A millionaire hears Lonnie's story. And the millionaire, the Lord spoke to him and said, pay that guy's airfare, pay everything. And he sent $25,000 for Lonnie. So that's how Lonnie started out this whole thing. So, so what... I'd like to do is just say that, you know, came out of Calvary Chapel, went into really the shepherding movement, got spit out on the other side of that thing, and went back to Calvary. And that's when I met Lonnie. That's when Lonnie and I connected, was in that time period. After he had come back for his world tour and with uh, Pete, and he was just trying to find what the Lord had for him in that, in that season. That's when our lives intercepted one another, 1979. So, you know, the interesting thing was the shepherding movement, you know, I just want to speak into that, and I hope there's not too much pushback, but 
I believe in discipleship, but this was a controlling kind of a discipleship. Really did some damage to the body of Christ. And um, once they repented, uh, it's almost like that's when Derek Prince's ministry flourished and took off. Even to this day, I listen to Derek all the time. So there was some really redemptive things that came out of it. And God really used that in a certain way. But it did impact the body of Christ. Some good, some bad. But uh, anyway, so, so there's two moves of God. The Jesus movement, the shepherding movement. Again, movements are called movements because they move people. So as I met Lonnie, I was going through a very... A severe time, I would say, in my life, you know, of a real painful experience that I was going through. And I was uh, looking to be roommates with a, another friend of mine who I was actually going to school with. Really bright guy, really together guy. I needed somebody like that stabilized, a very stable person to be in my life at that time. So anyways, his name was Mike McCoy. And Mike and I um, were meeting up. We're going to have dinner. We're, and Mike said, you know, I feel as though God is wanting me to move back with my old roommate who led me to the Lord, who discipled me. His name's Lonnie Frisbee, helped start Calvary Chapel. I didn't even know who he was. I said, really? I said, man, I'm not so sure. He came out of the discipleship movement. Okay, that, that's a red flag. Like, I got enough issues. I don't need somebody like that. So I go, we go over to Lonnie's house. He says, you need to meet Lonnie. So I go into this old, bohemic, cool little house. You know, I mean, my brother was an artist. My dad was an artist. I go in there and it's like an art studio. It's like, dude, this is like a hippie pad. Man, I've, I'm feeling this, you know, like, whoa. And then Lonnie came walking out and Lonnie was like five foot six, a buck 30 maybe. And he's looking at me and, you know, this guy's talking up Lonnie and I'm looking at him and he says to me, don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> I thought, oh, dude, this guy's reading my mind, you know. So we were, we were, engaging one another and he came over and he said hey so tell me your story so i was sharing my where my heart was at and what was go i was going through at that time man god really used lonnie to like do something in my heart you know to the, stop the bleeding and uh i was super grateful next day boof, 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 i'm on his door hey i'm your new roommate so i moved in with lonnie so we went on we did a lot together in that time period and um, very powerful. You know, we were uh, circling. We traveled all over, all over the world. We went to, traveled to Africa with them, traveled to Europe with them, traveled all over the, 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 uh, the place with Lonnie, Brazil, all kinds of places. But in this particular time period, we went to Europe together. And we just went and met with some missionaries that Lonnie had led to the Lord in Denmark. So we went over there to see how they were doing. We're walking up a street and people were yelling Lonnie's name in Denmark. Lonnie, Lonnie. I'm going, man, because back in the Jesus movement, you know, six years earlier, they had brought a revival to Denmark where the Holy Spirit moved amongst us. And this is where this couple came out of that. And so it was so fun to be able to be with him and to hang out with him. And we spent a lot of time just touring uh, Europe, really amazing time in that time period. And so as we were, we're always looking for anything that had any life to it. And uh, one thing that I loved about Lonnie, he was hungry for God. He was always hungry. I think honestly, the shepherding movement, one of the things that drew him to that was their incredible revelation of the kingdom of God. And, you know, it was a very overpowering kind of a thing. And I, I feel as though there was a transitional place for Lonnie in that particular move of God where he transitioned from a, I think, a evangelist to really a prophet. And, uh, you know, was starting to get the word of the Lord, like with real authority and stuff like that but anyways so he we would go circle all the different camps if god was moving on anything we would be there you know and it was always through the worship that we could determine whether 
there was anything happening. Well, we, we stumbled upon this church called Calvary Chapel Your Belinda. And boy, the worship in there was incredible. All kinds of people coming too. It's probably about, it was in a gymnasium, uh, some high school. And it was uh, very powerful. The worship was very powerful. And the guy whose church was the pastor of that church, his name was John Wimber. And so, uh, we, you know, we're kind of circling the camp and just enjoying the presence of God in the worship. And, you know, no catalytic boom would would uh, had started at that time. And so what we did was we went to go to a intercessory group meeting with that church. Because Lonnie said, let's hear what the Spirit's saying through the intercessors. So we get over to the intercessors. And people are in travail, weeping and wailing. And man, I've never seen that before. So I was asking one of the women there, what, what is happening? Yeah, I asked Lonnie first. He said, ask her. She said, we feel like the Lord is wanting to birth something in this church. And the, there's a, a cork in the middle of the bottle head. I said, What's, what is it? She said, it was the pastor. It was John Wimber. I said, wow. So I didn't know John at that time, and I didn't know what was happening with all of that. So the next thing I know, like within probably a month, we're in John's backyard, and him and his wife, amazing people. Oh, my goodness. He had the whole staff there, and he's inviting Lonnie, and because I was Lonnie's roommate, I'm going with him. And, uh, you know, we're all just hanging out in Wimber's backyard having a barbecue. Super cool. Um super cool people, you know, John, he wasn't a hippie, but you know, he was like in the music business. He knew he was just a cool, cool brother. And so, and his wife, Carol, very spiritual, very open, big hearted. Um, and so we, you know, we're just hanging out and they said, well, Lonnie, you know, we're going to cut you loose to do a mother's day meeting. I went, man, Lonnie, we're walking along the side of his house. I said, Lonnie, you know, he doesn't know what he's asking for. You know, Lonnie said, no, I'm going to behave myself. I'm not going to screw this up. Well, they invited him to speak at a Mother's Day meeting, and the rest is history. I mean, the Spirit of God dropped in that place. Lonnie, it was all good and well. You can, it's very well documented. John Wimber has spoken about it many times. But he said, man, when Lonnie got up there, oh, he's all happy it's not bad. He's, he's not going to harm anything. And then we said for the Holy Spirit to come, that we're not going to put the third person of the Godhead in a back room. We are going to now allow the Spirit of God to move in our midst. Boom. And he said, come Holy Spirit. I never heard anybody say that. You hear people say that all the time now. But, you know, the Spirit of God dropped in that place. I mean, 350 people, boom, on the ground. Well, Wimmer wasn't all that happy about it. So it, like, he's thinking it's going to screw the church up and, oh, my gosh, what's going on? Uh, you know, somebody, a microphone fell and a kid's, like, wailing in tongues. You know, it's like, bam, all over the gymnasium. They couldn't find, there were so many bodies on top of one another because the presence of God fell. And so what happened was, um, it was like, all of a sudden, it was like a move of God just happened in our midst. I could never even have fathomed this. And we had to have a special meeting for that meeting. And that's when, you know, like maybe 70 people showed up and it was at the Wagner house. And it was really quite interesting because I'm in this room with all these leaders and they're all upset and like, oh my gosh, the church is, we're going to destroy the church. And, you know, half the people were excited, half the people weren't. I was sitting next to the guy that was not happy. Lonnie gets up and he starts to share. Uh, you know, John says, well, Lonnie, why don't you explain to everybody what's happening? The more Lonnie talked, the stupider it got. I mean, he couldn't even put any theological content to it. It was like, oh, man. Whew. I could see Wimber was sweating bullets, man. And I was sitting next to a guy who was like very conservative kind of guy. foot's tapping. You know, you can almost feel the tension of this guy. And the more Lonnie's talking, it was it got worse. And Wimber steps up and says, well, I think what Lonnie's trying to say is, you know, and he puts all kinds of theological content to everything that he thought was happening. So, and, you know, <laughs> the, the room was just filled with this tension. 
And I'm watching everything, and Lonnie stands up. And, oh, before he did this, he kicked off his flip-flops, and he burped in the microphone because he had stomach problems. I'm just going, oh, man, wow. But Lonnie steps forward. He says, listen, that's not at all what I'm thinking. He said, what I think is we need to cry out to God and repent ourselves for what we've done to the third person of the Holy Spirit. Wham! The power of God fell right on us. We didn't get out of there for another two and a half hours. The presence of God just fell on us. It was so powerful. Well, everybody got on board quick. And that became what was called the Vineyard Movement. Because Chuck met with John. They had a meeting. Had all these Calvary Chapel pastors. Now, you have to understand... These guys all look to Chuck as their spiritual father. And so, you know, you've got now a decade of life together. And all you've known is, you know, what Calvary Chapel represents, you know, which is more uh, kind of a neo-Baptist, to be honest with you, type of an approach towards things. But, um, but good stuff, you know. I mean, I'm not criticizing. I'm just telling you that's more or less what it is. You're not going to—I don't see many people getting healed, baptized in the Holy Spirit, or delivered from demons in those camps. So, but you will get the Bible and there's good things in there. They just need to do the Bible, not just listen to the Bible. But so the Spirit of God fell. It was very powerful. Now, all of a sudden, you've got 1,500 people showing up. It went from 400 people to 1,500 people. People, when, they, when there's a move of God, when the Spirit of God is beginning to pour out, look at what's happening in Asbury. I mean, they had three times the amount of people coming to the city because they were hearing God is moving. Mm. That's what happens when a move of God happens. We couldn't contain what God was doing at the vineyard. This is like 1980. And we're coming out of this thing. And it was like driving up with a semi truck, you know, unloading AK-47s in the spirit and letting the spirit of God just move. And the Holy Spirit moved on everybody. In such a powerful way, we saw more deliverances, more uh, healings. It was mostly healings, not so much deliverances. And then all of a sudden, it, it was like a Ch Chuck and John met. All these pastors came. Uh, these are all spiritual sons. And Chuck said, today, we're going to divide. Whoever's going to go with John, go to this side. And whoever's going to stay with me, stay with me. And man, the guys were weeping and wailing in that room. And that was a big transitional place for people. So we all went back to Wimber's house. And, you know, Ken Gullickson, who actually started the vineyards up in L.A., uh, Bob Dylan came to the Lord up in L.A. with Ken. Uh, Keith Green came to the Lord with Ken. And Ken's playing the piano. And I'll never forget it. You know, we're all like, whoa, man, that what just happened. And there's probably maybe... 20 of us in this room and Ken's playing the piano and he said John I think the Lord wants me to surrender he had three churches at that time that were all called the vineyard he says I think I'm supposed to surrender the vineyard to you everybody looked at one another and said yeah that's a great name let's do that you know Lonnie and I had a ministry together we called it breaking bread ministry and so we took our ministry we submitted it to John and that became uh, Vineyard Ministries International. And so, you know, we're in this move of God, another vortex. I personally thought it was the 2.0 version of the Jesus movement, you know, because these, these movements have a propensity to not have a short shelf life, you know. And I thought in the Jesus movement that this is, was how we did it. And then it got all organized and it's kind of absorbed in the systems and, you know, and it, and, you know, that's just how it is. You know, these things get organized and administrators come in and they administrate the third person of the Godhead out of these things. But Lonnie was hard to contain in these things. And Lonnie was the catalyst for that movement, just like he was for the Calvary Chapel movement. Very powerful. So, so these are three movements that Lonnie was involved in. Jesus movement, that he was a catalyst for. The shepherding movement, which he wasn't a catalyst. He was just part of that, that he got chewed up and spit out on the other end of that one. 
and the vendor movement. So he was a catalyst for two of those three movements that influenced and impacted the body of Christ so far and wide that you couldn't even imagine. So we, we get into what God's doing at the vineyard for two, three years, and all of a sudden Lonnie's wheels are starting to fall off. You know, there's all kinds of controversy, rumors flying with Lonnie, and, you know, I'm his roommate, so, you know, it's like you can only imagine what people are saying about me. Um, which, you know, now, you know, I understand totally where John was coming from. I mean, he, he was... Uh, they were on the cusp of a of an international move of God. John was brilliant at marketing, and we also another big facet of this was the worship that was coming out of the vineyard. Man, it was some of the most powerful worship I'd ever heard. It was dropping us all to our knees. So with these moves of God comes worship, and so, but also with it comes money changing tables. You know, and once the money changing tables come in and they and that becomes a predominant thing, the oil stops and the inspiration stops and you never hear about it again. You know, it's amazing. It started with Maranatha music. That was the hippie music and that was man, powerful. And once the the you had to do, you know, two albums per quarter, boom, the oil stopped. Same you never hear about them again. Uh even with the shepherding movement, it came out with some really good worship. Again, money changing tables come, oil stops. Vineyard music had to have two per quarter albums, you know, because they, in the beginning, it was amazing worship. And then you could see that it was now becoming a business. That's really, that's really the painful thing for me to have watched. And, and certainly for Lonnie, you know, because Lonnie was always kind of pure hearted when it came to all of those kinds of things, you know, we would see these powerful moves of God. I mean, just the presence and power of God moving. And if if they had not taken an offering before, he would never allow an offering to be taken after the Spirit of God moved. He said, I will not prostitute the things of the Spirit like that. So he had a lot of integrity when it came to those kinds of things. But anyway, so, you know, Lonnie, a lot of People don't realize that Lonnie had some real issues, like growing up. That kind of rejected him, his, his biological father. Stepdad rejected him, um, gotten molested as a kid. It's in these books. There's three of these books. I'm going to read you a little bit of one of them. This one here is the third one, Set Free. And, um, you know, Lonnie went through a lot of issues that never got worked out, you know, from the molestations, from the rejection, from all of those kinds of things. And then what happens is he gets these rejections from father, stepfather, molestation. Now he's on the front end. He finds himself on the front end of a, of a move of God with Chuck. And so now he's going to Chuck and saying, Chuck, I've got these things are happening. Yeah. You know, Listen, nobody knew how to deal with that kind of stuff back in that time period of molestation, victimization. No, nobody knew how to deal with that. And Chuck just didn't have the capacity to do it. Plus, he's got, you know, a church now that's blowing up to 10,000 people. You know what I mean? What are you going to do? And Lonnie's, you know, <laughs> got issues. So now he's feeling used and somewhat abused. So now Chuck now kind of, he felt rejected by it. And then he goes to Bob Mumford. Bob Mumford rejects him, gets that. And then at the Vineyard Movement, Lonnie is very controversial. There's all kinds of rumors happening around him. And so what did John have to do? He had to push him away, I mean, which I understand, you know. But And I was going to stay in the Vineyard. But Lonnie was my best friend, so I couldn't leave him alone. So I had to go to a Durham's cave with him. And, and make sure he was okay because he was my buddy and I couldn't let him go. You know, he needed some help and we were best friends. I couldn't just discard him and jump with John and do all of that kind of stuff. So we started house churches down in San Diego. I was, we were just, I mean, you, you know, we work the streets. We do all kinds of things from probably 84 to 87. 
And so Lonnie moved down here and we were just trying to get some things worked out. And, you know, there's a scripture that says, uh, a root of bitterness defiles the many. And this is what I saw happening to Lonnie. Rejection, 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 rejection. N not dealing with sexual, you know, brokenness. It, it just difficult. And I saw this root of bitterness breaking. And so right around 1987, we had a house church. And, you know, the house church is just exploding, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of dynamic there. And, but Lonnie had this bile coming out of him from that bitterness. And none of the other brothers had the capacity to deal with him. But I had to stand up to him and tell him, if you don't stop what you're doing, you're going to get quarantined from the body of Christ. And Lonnie loved the church, wanted his ministry to, to may, be sustained, but he couldn't, you know. And I, this is when Lonnie and I had our split. So for two years, I didn't talk to Lonnie, from 87 to 89. And then a prophet gets a hold of Lonnie. And I didn't talk to him at all. Lonnie ends up calling me, 1989. And uh, he said, hey, bro, um, the Lord is dealing with me. And this prophet guy came and had three pages of like time dates, time dates, times of me. And he said, I'm, I'm completely like flabbergasted that the Lord's tracking me like he is. But in one of those little things was your name. And the Lord said, you need to reconcile with John. So here I am. And, you know, so Lonnie and I met in South Africa with Derek Morphew, a good friend of mine. And Lonnie's a good friend, great theologian, great brother in the Lord. So we fly over there and we meet with Derek just to kind of get things worked out. I end up going to Brazil with Lonnie. At, and this is New Year's, 1989 going into 1990. And so, you know, I'm still seeing Lonnie trying to get a hold of his life and trying to recover from this. And, you know, this sexual wounding and the sexual, uh, even, you know, falling into any kind of perversion, things like that, um, you know, it wasn't done around me. And I, you know, look, I, I just had grace for Lonnie to help him try to work out what needed to get worked out because he was my friend and God's hand was on Lonnie. And so, I want to share a little bit out of this book, the set free one. This is the third book. There's three of these books that if you want to know about Lonnie, this is Lonnie's words. You know, I highly recommend you like researching that. And, you know, it's just simple books of Lonnie talking. He wanted me to do the, to write these books. But what he did was we just tape recorded everything and they transcribed everything. But this is like, uh, you know, by 1990, 91, we're in, I moved Lonnie into my house up in Poway down in San Diego. And you don't just move Lonnie in, you move the entourage of whoever Lonnie's discipling, which is usually people demonized. And, you know, so now I've got a house full of demonized people along with Lonnie in my house. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's everything you can have to, hold, to, to try to get through those kinds of things. So, um, anyways, uh, I didn't find out, Lonnie didn't come and confess that he had the AIDS virus until 1991. And, um, no, I'm sorry, 1992, because I married Clara, my wife, in 92. And I came off of a plane uh, with my spiritual father, Harold Bredesen, and we were, I'll never forget, my wife says, hey, Lonnie wants to pick you up. Okay, well, that's kind of weird. What does Lonnie want to to pick me up for. He picks me up at the airport. We go to the Hotel Dell in San Diego here. And he says, I got to talk to you. And he begins to tell me that he has AIDS virus, that he's HIV positive, and that it's actually gripping him now. And he, it was the hardest thing that he could do because I was his best friend. And I'm just going, what? Wow. How did this happen? When did this happen? Well, obviously it had happened years before because, you know, by that time period, you know, it had already come, come from HIV positive to AIDS. 
And man, that was a really, really tough time. Um, really broke my heart. Broke my heart for Lonnie. That he had to hold this thing in, you know. But uh, in this book, I, and I remember, like, we were uh, taking care of Lonnie, my wife and I, at the end there. You know, he would, uh, he had some caretakers with him, but we were, um, I didn't realize how painful that virus was and what it emaciated him, you know. And I remember saying to Lonnie, Lonnie, why don't you let me interview you? And I think homosexuality is going to be a big deal to the body of Christ later. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but Lonnie's been dead for 30 years. March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, we did his, his uh, funeral. It's crazy to think of, you know, 30 years ago. So I said, why don't you let me interview you and you can tell the body of Christ. I said, I think it'll have great impact for later. Not maybe so much for now. But by that time, he was going blind. He was emaciated. It was horrible. And he said, bro, I've got everything straightened out. I got everything right with God. I got everything right with the people that I had held all this pain with. And I'm good to go. I, I don't have the energy to, to sh show up on a camera screen and do this. He said, but God will work it out. So I, I got this book and... You know, I was thinking, man, I'm in this book. I should read, start reading this book. So I did. I started reading it. And I looked, and it was chapter 22. I was just kind of reading through it all, and, and it says, Eternal Perspectives. I thought, whoa, what's this? And this is Lonnie's, like, deathbed confession. Mm. I mean, it is so powerful. I'm reading through this. I'm just going, here it is. This is the interview that I wanted to do with Lonnie. Wow. It's all here. This is awesome. So I want to read a couple of excerpts from this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, but get the book and read the chapter. It says, uh, let me just read a couple of things here. Um, uh, the Bible says God is love. There is a good starting point to talk about love. I bet I heard a thousand, that a thousand times. How could a loving God... Is all powerful and loving. Why doesn't he eradicate cancer? And while he's at it, all diseases. They're usually honest questions from sincere people. However, many times they're bitter questions from a deeply hurt person who blames God for something. And then there is the super angry individual who does not really have a question. He has accusations. Because of the hard questions, many people have concluded that there is no God at all. To them, God is a concept for weak-minded, uneducated, blind people. Sorry. Guilty as a charged, because I absolutely believe in God and all, with all my heart. I know that he loves me. He's demonstrated that love in millions of ways. I also have had many hard things to overcome in my life, some of which you've been reading about. But I never blamed God. I blamed others, and I blamed myself. God is in the process of setting me free from my bitterness and actually setting me free from myself. I love that. When we repent and receive Christ, who was, who was God actually becoming one of us, he also became the ultimate demonstration of love. Greater love hath no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus bled real blood on a cruel Roman cross. I love the way that Lonnie, you know, that, that, that evangelistic thing comes off on him in everything that he writes. You know, it's always pointing it back to Jesus. And this is on his deathbed, so... Good to hear this. He goes down and he says, when people get in touch with their mortality, it often drives them to God. As I've revealed to you, unless a total miracle happens, I'm probably going to die from the very cruel disease. It was definitely put me in touch with my mortality. Even though I have walked with Jesus since I was eight years old, child, and have been full-time ministry for over 20 years, this reality of death sentence still sent me reeling it has caused me to dive much deeper into God. It causes me, and hopefully you also, to have an increased eternal perspective, which is a good thing, because guess what? You're going to die. Probably not as soon as I am, but Jesus, unless Jesus returns first, we're going to experience physical death. So since my cruel disease of being HIV positive 
with the incurable prospect of AIDS virus taking my life. It has impacted every area of my life and especially my emotions in a very dramatic way. Just carrying the news by myself for years. See, I didn't know anything about this. You know, he, sh he shared this really two years before he died. And by that time, he's heading into the AIDS section of that. As mentioned, the shocking news caused me to go deeper into God myself and actually search the depths of my soul. The process became a rotating good, bad, and ugly season over and over. And he goes on, he says, the Holy Spirit really, really is our comforter. And so many times he very lovingly and supernaturally touched me with the peace and the assurance that Jesus is walking this out with me. And so he goes down, I'll read another paragraph down below here, it says, this ongoing process has prompted me to somewhat address the subject of a gay lifestyle. And this is really what I want to talk about, because this is kind of the controversy here. You know, homosexuality is a huge subject in itself, which I briefly address in the last segment of my life story. I said it was a counterfeit. But I would like to go into a subject a little more at this time. I do not consider myself to be an expert in any way, but I have my personal experiences and have looked into the subject from several angles. For me, of course, the most important angle is what does God say about homosexuality? Well, God is not negligent about condemning all categories of sin and harmful choices that we make. And there is a long list that he warns us about, including the so-called gay lifestyle. In case you might not have read the Great Commission, which I, I stated, I never lived the gay lifestyle. Okay, this is Lonnie's words. I would like to add that I've never even considered myself a homosexual at all. Even though I had been molested for years as a child, had sexually experimented as part of the rebellious free love generation during the teenage years in the 60s. There is also my disappointing backsliding days in the mid 80s. And I have described that I have described in this book. Listen, one of the things that I loved about Lonnie and really what I love about the hippies is we're very authentic, man. Very truthful, very authentic, very real about things. And that, that's what I liked about Lonnie. Lonnie was, everything was on his sleeve, man. Back during the 1967 Summer of Love in Haight-Ashbury, when I was a student at the Academy of Art University, I listened to all the voices and opinions. After all, it was the age of Aquarius. There was major movements that were birthed during the radical time, the hippie movement, the feminist movement, the Black Panthers, the gay movement, and the Jesus people movement. Notice, movements. And we're about ready to hit another movement. So I'm excited about that. And he says this, he says, um, I listened to all the voices with an open mind, but on a visit back to, to, to Heeks, to Tahoex Canyon in Southern California, I, I, with a call to serve him, he says this, I'm sorry, it was the voice of God and a supernatural visitation with a call to serve him. And that's in that canyon. I said yes to that voice, and that call, and it was the very best decision I ever made. And he goes on, he says, but I must say that I have respect for many of my friends who have chosen the gay lifestyle. They are among some of the most gifted, talented, and loving individuals in the world. Being an artist and being part of the entertainment world, when, when I was a teenage cash member of Shebang, weekly TV show, I met so many creative, interesting, and famous people. Many were gay. Most were still in the closet at the time. I can honestly say that I love my gay friends, but there is a huge difference between love and approval. So he goes on and he sh shares this. And th this is an interesting part of this. He says, in fact, I love all of my friends, Christian, non-Christian, black, white, gay, straight, young, old. But I also know from experience that people's choices can lead them down a totally destructive path. God is clear in the Bible that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That one verse is among many that clearly declares the love and severity of God. He warns us that all sins, little or big, which can range from lying and gossiping to adultery and murder, along with anything in between, can have immediate to eternal consequences. I am totally forgiven by my Lord, but I'm also paying the consequences of my sin even right now. Okay, this is, this is somebody 
on a deathbed confession. This is my friend, Lonnie, being very honest and very open about all of these things. Let me go on. If you see your rambunctious three-year-old who somehow escaped a watchful eye and is ready to run out in a busy street, you would run to the rescue out of love, but also discipline him and try to explain the danger. Sometimes God severely disciplines us when we stubbornly choose to do our own thing and we ignore all the warnings. At the same time, to complicate things more, we're in the middle of a total cosmic war between good and evil, between God and Satan, for the souls of mankind. You need to know up front that God is going to win this war, even though the devil shoots real bullets and will take a great number of people along with him, and, and it's a very real hell. Because many of us have backgrounds in drug culture, you might be able to relate to some of my conclusions. And he goes down and he says this, um, he says, other f friends progressed on to harder drugs. Uh, let, let me read the context of this. I'm sorry, I jumped a little bit further ahead. Because many of us have a background of drug culture, you might be able to relate to some of my conclusions. In the beginning, drugs are usually fun. Seems like everyone is getting involved, including most of your friends. You discover that society was lying to you about certain facts in a hypocritical way. You have to discover almost a, like a family-like com camaraderie in your rebellion against the status quo. But then things begin to unravel. In my case, close friends overdosed on LSD. Others' friends progressed to harder drugs like cocaine and heroin. The fun turns into a nightmare of addiction, incarceration, and fatalities. Consider the long line of rock stars that never made it. And he begins to name some of those. So he goes on, he says, as we examine some of this, there is a pattern that I've seen in many lives, including my own. As a child, I was starving for affection. My natural father beat me and left. My stepfather raised me in cruel rejections. Then I was eight. A male babysitter showed me so much attention and kindness, playing games with me with fun and laughter. He often had me sit on his lap while he stroked my hair. But one day he took me in the shower and molested me. That was the beginning of a nightmare in my life that I cannot fully express. The babysitter was a dark evangelist hmm. sent by demonic forces to ruin my life two weeks after I became a Christian as a child. You know, I feel a sense of destiny around this. I feel sovereign peace, and I believe that Rich Bueller, Rich Bueller was a man back in that time period that was helping Lonnie process this stuff because there was not many people that were helping people from victimizations and things like that. It just wasn't around. People didn't know how to deal with it. Um, Rich Bueller was used by God to bring a major breakthrough in my life. I pray you also will be able to tap into that love and power of the Holy Spirit. Last year, Rich met with me and said, Lonnie, I believe that God can use you in another major movement, and that would be with the plight of adults molested as children and who have been victimized people. They are victims who don't know how to protect themselves from other people. And then he goes on, he says, many people who have studied victimization say that it actually paralyzes you so that you become like a highly wrapped mummy and have no ability to resist. You have no ability to have walls. The foundation of their life were cracked years ago. The kick, that This kicks in what they call a season of destruction. So like I said, I feel destined to reveal everything. I have no reason to hold anything back that's ever happened to my life because... I want to see people helped. And Rich Bueller thinks that my story will be able to reach and help a lot of people. This absolutely is the main reason why I feel my healing story needs to be told about my victimization. I suffered years of bondage in my emotions. I didn't know how to get out of what was continually coming to me, coming on me. And that particular time in the 50s, nobody had any information about victimization and nobody would ever allow anybody to talk about child molestation because it was anathema in our society. The people didn't know how to handle it. They were too ashamed even to have enter into a dialogue. And now we're finding that pedophiles are permeating through the American culture. And it's not only with molestations of, of older men hitting on younger boys and on little children, but it's also Mothers molesting sons, young girls by the thousands are getting violated by family members, neighbors, teachers, on and on. Like Dylan said, old men turning your daughters into whores. And so this whole plight of, you know, fathers, daughters, mothers, sons, brothers, sisters, 
cousins is being uncovered in epidemic portions in our society. And he goes on down a little further and he says, some people are drawn into the gay lifestyle and are very conflicted, having feelings of guilt and shame, even when others try to convince them that it's, it is normal, just an alternative. At some point, I believe many begin to believe the lie and the enemy sears their conscience. Now listen to this. This is an important part of this. He says, sears their conscience and they embrace the lifestyle. At this point and onward, I see the demonic entities are controlling the direction of that life unknowing, knowingly to the victim. Some not only embrace the lifestyle, but actively, willingly, and creatively attempt to promote the gay agenda, therefore becoming dark evangelists. I like that term. My babysitter was definitely a dark evangelist, even pedophile. Every pedophile in the world is a dark evangelist. Every Hollywood scriptwriter who's trying to cleverly sell homosexuality to a generation is a dark evangelist. The homosexual world is being revealed for what it is, a powerful counterfeit. God has given me a pro prophetic gift, and if I do not warn you, your blood will be on your blood will be on my hands. Right now, Satan is attempting to sell homosexuality to the whole world, not just America. He wants to destroy Christianity, the family unit, and really to destroy mankind. He's also using war, drugs, false religions, adultery, rape. And I'm almost done here, but. Uh, money, power, greed, every other kind of vice and deception to kill and destroy. I'm saying all this without wanting to condemn anyone, but to speak the truth in love. I'm saying turn to Jesus because he's the only one who can deliver you. God has already won the war on the cross and in the empty tomb. And he goes on and he says, get an eternal perspective because that's what he's getting. So I, I wanted to share that part of it. I don't think Greg had the bandwidth to do this. He's doing a, you know, he's, he probably re has read this, but, you know, he's putting out the Jesus Revolution movie and, you know, he stops kind of short on some of these things. But I want you to know, this is my friend Lonnie. Lonnie's the real deal. He had some real issues. It's so funny. We did, oh, I was reading this to my wife and I don't know why, but it, his funeral popped up. Well, I preached at his funeral, and Chuck preached at his funeral. My wife also spoke at his funeral, and it was me speaking. It just came up on her iPad. I mean, I haven't seen that for 30 years, and I'm speaking, and I remember telling my wife, don't tell me what you're going to say because I need to get the word of the Lord over Lonnie. My word over Lonnie was he had a Samson anointing. My wife's word was he had a Samson anointing. Chuck's word was Lonnie has had a Samson anointing. And so, you know, look, we all got issues, man. You know, the wages of sin is death. That's what Lonnie said. That's what the scripture says. So that's what it is. You know, people fall. I mean, thank God he could get redeemed at the end. I'm praising the Lord for that. You know, all of us have had all kinds of issues that have hit all of our lives. And I'm thanking God. You know, the consequences of Lonnie's decisions, I mean, it cut his, short, his life short. Horrible. But at the end, God redeemed and God restored everything. And I was thanking God that was in this book. So that's a real story. Thank you for listening. God bless you. See you then.